really looking forward to tonight's program. I hope you come away with it with a sense of having met someone that perhaps you haven't heard before in this light, someone who has led a most unusual life, a man who has literally devoted 47 years, I think, of his life trying to roll back the mysteries of the occult, of the secret societies, of the Illuminati, of the globalists, of those uh, arcane groups of killers who have been running things for centuries, centuries upon centuries. The imagery you see around you, the symbolism is everywhere. Without the work of this man, many of us would never understand what we are literally seeing almost every day of our lives in terms of symbols of evil, symbols of control, symbols of, of globalism and domination and subjugation and subversion of the free will of men and women, of the rollback and destruction, the deconstruction, the demolition of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. This man has done more to contribute to the understanding of the reality, not the conspiracy. The conspiracy is real, but the reality of the world in which we live, in which we suffer, and in all too many cases in which we die prematurely. He is a brilliant man. He is a scholar without equal in his field. His work has literally spawned the careers of many of the so-called leading lights of information, of research, of revelation in terms of how the world is run today. I will not name any names, but the work of this man has been borrowed, it has been stolen, it has been plagiarized, it has been perverted and corrupted and used to literally feather the nests of many people who haven't the common courtesy of even mentioning this man's name. He is a man that many of you, I think over a million now, have seen the film Zeitgeist on the Internet. Maybe two million. It's way, way up there. It's obviously a runaway, a huge sensation blockbuster online. And the man's voice you hear in the beginning, the man who speaks so matter-of-factly but so brilliantly, intensely about things that are, are going on all around us, is Jordan Maxwell. Hello, my friend, and welcome back. Hello there, Jeff. Uh... As, as really feels strange being back on the radio again because I haven't done radio in about seven years, and, um, and and the only reason I'm doing this show is because of my high regard for your person and your work and your program. Because <clears throat> like, because you were right, I, I haven't done any radio or any public lectures or anything since 2001. I just uh, gave up. I just threw my hands up after 47 years of talking about it. And when it finally, um, you know, came on the scene in your face, uh, I just was, uh, I just was so depressed, and um, you know, that I just gave up. I just decided not to, not to try and talk anymore. It's what I was warning and talking about all these years. Uh, it's finally happened, and uh, I, I don't know what else to say about it. Jordan, you know, the ironic part of it is, and it truly is irony, is that you, uh, and there's, there's only one other man I would mention in the same, in the same paragraph you, with you, and that is the uh, former British Secret Service uh, professional for over 30, 35 years, who is an American constitutional scholar. Oh, His name yes. is D Dr. John Coleman. Oh, yes. Whose yes. work has also been ruthlessly stolen by so many people and used without attribution. Uh, between the two of you, I, I hold none in higher esteem or higher regard. And, well, I appreciate uh, that. I thank you for yeah. it. Now, what the irony of it is, my friend, and we've talked about this, is that you, above all Americans, with the uh, inclusion of Dr. John Coleman, are, in my estimation, you are as high a level... Uh, spiritually, morally, politically, intellectually, a patriot as there is. There are none higher. And what you are is a hero. What you are is a man who have tried his very best to wake up this fading nation, to shake it out of its lethargy, and to urge it to take back its birthright, that which the Founding Fathers gave us all. But what has happened to Jordan Maxwell, the patriot, the hero, the bizarre irony, the turnaround, the inside out, the black is white, the up is down yeah. ethic of these lunatics? Who are you today, Jordan? Are you a hero? 
No, no. As a matter of fact, I live in one room, uh, actually a two-room office, with my brother, who is very sick, and he lives in one room, and I live in the other in Los Angeles. I have no uh, bank accounts. I have no, I have no, um, no, no money, no bank accounts, no uh, credit cards, um, no checking account. And I, how I are you? And and how are you held by the government? and the institutions of this oppressive, evil cartel, cabal, occult group who have subverted the United States, who have taken over the United States, how are you held? What is your position today? You are the enemy. You're not the hero. That's right. Everything Uh, is ass backwards. Yeah, that's exactly why I haven't said or done anything since 2001. My phones are tapped. I am threatened. Uh, I was on a major radio, I did only uh, maybe two radio shows in the past seven years, and I was on a major radio talk show, uh, and then toward the end of the, um, toward the end of the interview, about, uh, uh, about 20 minutes before the end of it, I happened by chance to bring up a subject which I don't normally talk about, and immediately my phone was disconnected at the telephone company. The telephone company disconnected <laughs> by phone. Yeah. Um, you know, while I'm on the air in a national radio talk show. And uh, the moment it went off, I thought maybe it was something wrong with my phone. So I continued to listen, and immediately, maybe three or four seconds after it went off, uh-huh. my phone came back on again, and uh-huh. I could hear people walking around in an office talking. Uh-huh. And it was obviously a very small office because you could hear the reverberations of their feet walking around. Uh, you could hear them walking and talking to each other. And somebody said, one of the guys said to somebody else, somebody's going to have to deal with this guy. And then somebody mentioned something about the phone, and then they walked over, and you heard, and, and I heard them walking over to the phone, and then they hung it up. So, obviously, uh, NSA or CIA or somebody has uh, got a direct connection to AT&T and will cut off my phone uh, from the telephone company any time I talk about things which uh, are too explosive to be given to the American people. And I might add that there are many things that Jordan Maxwell knows, knows of, knows about, uh, which he will not speak to virtually anyone about uh, for that, that right. very reason. Yeah, you've got that right. There are many things I could tell you. I'm not about to tell you. I, I'm too old and tired to be uh, to be arrested at three o'clock in the morning and taken to some warehouse and Billy with a Billy club and beaten to the or fingers cut off and all of that stuff that's going on now in America. Not me. I, I give up. I, as far as I'm concerned, I was. I was the one back in 1960, 61 and 62, while, when Kennedy was still alive. I was giving lectures in downtown L.A. at little bookstores and little mom-and-pop uh, stores on secret societies, the Illuminati, Bible codes, Knights Templars, international banking cartels, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I thought I was doing something to awaken my fellow man and my country only to discover that today I am now the enemy. Right. Now I'm the one that is the, you know, the hunted. The hunter becomes the hunted. Well, I'm probably in the same train with you going to some destination. Yeah, me too. I think you're right. Um, what we're going to do tonight is not talk about secret societies and the occult things that go on and the Illuminati. What we're going to talk about are some of the experiences in Jordan Maxwell's life which are, I guess we could say, paranormal. We could also say bizarre. We could also say incredible. And you're going to hear some things tonight that are are just, uh, certainly they're entertaining, but beyond that they're going to provoke some pretty interesting reactions in your mind. What was it like for you? Where did you grow up? Was Was it Florida? Do I remember? Yeah, oh, it was it was Florida. That's uh, right. I remember Florida. Okay, yeah, it's it been so. A, it's you know, it's been over ten, twelve years since we talked I know, about this. I know. Uh, it, <clears throat> I was born in a town called Pensacola, Florida. Sure. Which is uh, about, and I was about a mile and a half from Gulf Breeze, which is a famous uh, 
UFO. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, yeah. So I grew up with all kinds of uh, other world experiences from as far back as I can remember as a child. Um, <clears throat> for instance, I, I, I pulled my bed in my bedroom, I pulled my bed up to the window so at night I could uh, look at the stars and talk to God. And one, and I used to wake up in the middle of the night and I would see someone at my, at my window because it's very warm uh, in Florida. And so, uh, you know, I'd have the windows all open, of course, with the screen. And yeah. I would wake up and I would see someone just for a moment, just for a fleeting moment, I would see someone was there. And when they woke up, they quickly, uh, you know, moved. But how, I how old were you about, Jordan? Uh, maybe eight, okay. maybe seven or eight, nine mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. And I quickly I uh, hit the screen, opened the screen, and my dog was in the backyard. The moon was full. I remember this so clearly, many times happening. <clears throat> and the dog was sitting there, said nothing, and uh, the, the yard was totally uh, open, and there was nobody there. But I saw them. So uh, I started having... Uh, for a lack of a better term, other world experiences uh, at a very early age, going out of my body, that was a whole off-the-wall experience, too, at eight years old, nine years old. OBE? <clears throat> yeah. And, I, and what, this was in a dream state, or were you conscious? Well, you, I, you... What happened is, in the middle of the night, I, I woke up, and I was about, uh, I'd say, five or six miles from home, standing on a, on a concrete overpass, a bridge over some train uh, tracks on the uh, west side of town. And this was back in, uh, you know, 45, 46. Now, is, are these are dreams, Jordan, or were you actually, did you actually no, find no, yourself well, standing I, well, there? Yeah, well, I was actually standing there because I was freezing cold. I was in my night clothes and I was freezing. Huh. And I and I stood between the pylons of the bridge mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to protect me from the wind chill, huh. and I was freezing and shuddering. And uh, <clears throat> middle of the night, I would say probably like one or two in the morning, mm -hmm. and I kept wondering why am I out here on this bridge? And I saw a car. I heard a car because at that time uh, the city was very very small, mm -hmm. and uh, I heard a car speeding. Uh, on the street that the bridge was on, and I looked out past the, the the bridge pylon to see the car, and it was running red lights. Well, there's nobody around in that small town at 2 in the morning, but nonetheless, they're running red lights. Mm -hmm. And they started up the uh, street, they started up the hill, coming onto the, uh, you know, onto the bridge I'm on, mm -hmm. and I'm freezing, and I'm watching them. And as they passed me, I saw the two girls in the back seat saw me and waved at me. Teenagers. Uh, yeah, teenagers. And mm -hmm. I, I knew all four of them. The boys in the front seat were, were uh, you know, they saw me. And uh, and and I, I just thought the whole thing was so strange that they shot past me speeding. And as they went down on the other side, I, 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 wa I stepped out so I could watch them. And they blew a tire toward the end of the uh, down. Uh, down, you know, off the bridge, but I could see them. They blew a tire, lost control of the car, skidded around, and they went into the a parking lot of a of a restaurant. And I watched them as they skidded across the parking lot, hitting cars because they totally lost control, and crashed into the front of the restaurant. And and I I was so frightened because I even. At eight years old, I had the presence of mind to know that what I've just witnessed is a terrible incident. So I ran across the bridge to the other side, because that's where the uh, the restaurant was. was and you're, the other you're, side. you're barefooted at this and time. And I'm barefooted, yeah. yeah. And I ran down the bridge, uh, going down to see if I could help them. Mm -hmm. And I'm freezing cold, and I'm screaming to myself. I remember yelling to myself. Don't fall because I was running in my night clothes, and I said, and I was yelling at myself. Don't fall because I know at the speed I'm going, I'm going to you know, strike myself bad. So, and then I ran across the parking lot, and it's only halfway across the parking lot that I realized that I was on gravel, and and my feet. You know, of course, it was hurting. I was in bare feet on gravel, <clears throat> and. Uh, and I remember distinctly thinking instantly, well, it's halfway to the restaurant as opposed to halfway back to the 
sidewalk, you might as well go on and finish what you started. So I ran on into the restaurant and saw all of this incredible, uh, you know, chaos and, and tragedy and bloodshed everywhere. And it was a horrible scene, as you can imagine, a car crashing into a restaurant. I, I woke up uh, a few minutes later, mm-hmm. and I'm in bed, mm-hmm. sweating profusely and and uh, crying. And I was very, very upset. My, my family came in, settled me down, and uh, I told them what I had seen, what I had witnessed. And uh, I told them about the boys. They knew the kids. They knew the boys and the girls. And mm-hmm. So the next morning, <clears throat> we found that uh, it was a story was going around that uh, exactly what I said had happened, had happened, just the way I said it had. And my mother, I remember looking at me like uh, she had no idea in the world what was going on. I mean, I didn't either, but... Uh, she couldn't figure out how in the world I could have known all of that. And mm-hmm. I don't, you know, at the time, I didn't understand what was going on either. But uh, I had many, many experiences uh, in my hometown. One night... What happened uh, to the uh, to your friends, by the way? Everyone's... Well, I, I, you know, they were, they were killed. All of them? Yeah, I guess so. I don't remember exactly all the, mm-hmm. the details, but uh, it was a pretty horrible mess. Yeah, okay. And... Uh, and uh, you know, like I was, like I said, I was about eight years old. Right. Just pretty, a blinding, pretty horrifically uh, traumatizing thing. To, yeah, for an eight-year-old to yeah. see. And then, not too long, uh, another experience that was really violent, as far as I'm concerned, was I woke up one night, in the middle of the night, and I went totally ballistic. When I woke up, there was an entity in the room, and it, it was—I cannot tell you how evil the presence was to my spirit i whatever it was that was in my room was so profoundly evil that my spirit picked up on it and woke up and knew that it was in the room i jumped up in the middle of the bed and started screaming and i went totally out of control i was yelling and screaming and of course middle of the night the windows opened the whole neighborhood heard me and i was out of control and my family, my mom and dad, come running into the room and flipped on the lights. And I remember distinctly yelling at the top of my voice and screaming at my family not to come in the room. I said, don't come in this room. And my mother is now crying, and she's you know, she's beside herself. She doesn't know what what's going on. And uh, every time they started to come out, out fully into the room, I would scream and yell at them to stay out of the room. And uh, and my dad would yell at me, why? And I said, because he's here. He's in the room. He's standing over there. And I pointed at a particular area of the room, mm-hmm. and I could feel this very evil energy uh, circulating around the room. I watched. I could feel it moving uh, to one corner, and then I felt it coming near the bed. And I kept screaming to my family, don't come in this room. He's in here. You were trying to protect them, obviously. I was trying yeah. to protect them. Mm-hmm. And whatever it was, it was there. I mean, the, um, you know, as an eight-year-old, I'm not dreaming this stuff up in the middle of the night. I was, I was totally ballistic. And um, finally, I kept screaming for it to go away, and it, and I felt the energy go out the wall. It left and went out, uh, went out of the house. And when it left through the wall, I fell down on the bed and I screamed. I said, "He's gone! It's gone!" 